Well, good morning again. I brought my uh, Iron Shed shirt with me this morning, and I'll tell you about this shirt. On the front, it says Iron Shed Gym, established 2010. And I was originally going to just describe this, but I thought you'd get a better idea if I showed it to you. On the back, it says, nobody likes a chump. Okay, nobody likes a chump. Now, let me tell you about this shirt. When I was in college, I trained with the track team at UNC Charlotte for 10 months out of the year. But for the other two months out of the year, I was on my own, and I needed a place to work out. And I had a friend of mine in Charlotte who was a pastor. His name is Clint, and he had a shed in his backyard full of weightlifting equipment, and he called it the Iron Shed. And he was a friend of my dad's, and so I asked if I could work out with him one summer. Now, I could tell you a lot of stories about the shed. Um, If you threw up during a workout, which wasn't out of the ordinary, then you had to write on the wall in Sharpie, I blew chunks. And then you had to sign your name and date it. Um, If you said something stupid, you also had to write what you said on the wall and sign it with a Sharpie. Uh, Now, I never threw up during a workout, but my name is on the wall twice, Um, and uh, I'll let you guys put the pieces together there, but that's a story for a different time. But here's what you need to know about the shed. If you wanted to work out at the shed, you had to commit, because the workout started three days a week at 6.30 a.m., and the workouts were brutal. It was a bunch of old guys and me, but they were not playing around. And if you committed to work out in the shed, you couldn't come and go. You were held accountable. And I learned this the hard way because there were a couple times that I slept through my alarm. And if I wasn't there at 6.30 a.m. sharp, I would start getting calls and texts from the other guys who worked out at the shed calling me a chump. And they would want to know where I was. Now, that only happened a few times because I learned. When my alarm went off around 545, I didn't want to get up. But I didn't want to be a chump. And so I got up, and I went, and I worked out. Now, was all that accountability worth it? Yes, because I got that shirt. And I can tell that story. You got the shirt if you didn't miss a workout for three months. But... More importantly, when I came back after that summer, I actually had the best speed and strength training that I'd ever had to start the fall. And the reason why was because in previous summers, I had managed my own workouts. And I had taken my own responsibility for whether or not I would work out. I didn't have the accountability. But when I went back after working at the shed, I'd been held accountable all summer. So I hadn't missed a single workout, even though I was late to a few. So the next summer, even though it was painful, I was right back at the shed to work out again because I was ready for some more accountability. Now, I'm telling you this story because it illustrates the power of accountability in our lives. And this morning, we're going to finish our sermon series on the parables of Jesus and Luke by looking at a parable about accountability, the parable of the ten minas. And if you have a Bible, you can find the parable of the ten minas in Luke 19, 11 through 27. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, you will want one to follow along with the sermon, and you can use one of the black pew Bibles that's in the pew in front of you, and you can find Luke 19, 11 through 27 on page 878 of that pew Bible, page 878. Now, before I read this passage, you need to know one more thing. In my opinion, and it's just my opinion, the parable of the ten minas is the most difficult parable to understand in the book of Luke. That's just what I think. So, it's going to take some work this morning to understand it. But when we come to passages like this, the worst thing that we can do is skip it or skim over it. Because as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to know everything that Jesus teaches 
to his disciples to the best of our abilities. So it's going to take some elbow grease, but I think that we can arrive at an understanding of this parable this morning. So will you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Luke 19, beginning in verse 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, You are to be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, and at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him, and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. You may be seated. Understanding this parable hinges on one question. Who's the bad guy? Who's the bad guy in this story? At first, you might think that the king in the parable is the villain. Some of his citizens hate him. The third servant says that the king is harsh and takes what doesn't belong to him. And the parable ends with the king rebuking the third servant and having his enemies executed in front of him. So it might seem like the king is the bad guy in the story, and the third servant and his citizens are the victims. But that's actually not the case at all. Did you notice that Jesus never says in the parable that any of the accusations against the king are true? Did you notice that? While the citizens hate the king, there's no explanation why. And think about it this way. If the king is actually the rightful ruler, then their hatred of him and their attempt to stop him from becoming king is rebellion against the rightful ruler. Also, the third servant says that the king is harsh and severe, but the king actually proves him wrong by generously rewarding the first two servants. So the third servant says that the king is harsh, but the king is handing out cities like candy to the servants who actually obey his orders. So the third servant doesn't seem to understand the king at all. When I was in high school at Hickory Ridge High School in Harrisburg, North Carolina, I had an English teacher named Miss Klein. And when I found out that I had Miss Klein the summer before my sophomore year of high school, I was very worried because I had heard about Miss Klein from some of my friends. I had heard that she was strict. I'd heard that she was mean. 
and I heard that she was hard. But I actually had a surprising experience with Miss Klein that year. I found out that she was strict, but her rules were fair. And I found out that she wasn't mean at all if you participated in class and did what she asked. And she actually had a sense of humor. And I found out that she was hard, but it was because she had high expectations. And she gave really good and detailed feedback on my assignments. Miss Klein actually turned out to be the best teacher that I had had in four years of high school. And I learned things in her class that I took with me all the way through my doctoral work. I learned things in my sophomore English class that I was using years later. Miss Klein was such a talented teacher, not just my opinion, that she eventually became the principal of Hickory Ridge High School. So why did my friends warn me about Miss Klein? Well, the answer might sound harsh, but it's obvious, isn't it? The problem wasn't with Miss Klein. The problem was with my friends. My friends didn't want teachers with high expectations. <laughs> my friends didn't want to work hard. They didn't want to follow rules. They didn't want to be held accountable. So they didn't like her. And that's similar to what's happening in the parable of the ten minus. The problem isn't with the king. The problem is with the rebellious citizens and the unfaithful servant who misunderstand, fear, hate, and disobey the king. So we've answered the question, who's the bad guy? So now I can give you three keys to understanding this parable. And here's the first. The nobleman who becomes king in this parable represents Jesus. And he told this parable for a specific reason. He wanted his disciples to understand that he wasn't going to instantly become king when he entered Jerusalem. Look at verse 11 in our passage. Luke 19, 11 says, As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. You see, Jesus was confronting an expectations problem. Last year, Emily and I were in Scottsdale, Arizona for a wedding, and Emily was a bridesmaid. And if you know anything about weddings and women, you know that bridesmaids have to report for duty very early on the day of the wedding. So the wedding was at 5 p.m., but Emily had to leave our hotel at 7.15 a.m., to start getting ready for a 5 p.m. wedding. So I didn't need quite that long. And so I was on my own in Scottsdale for a whole day. And to pass the time, I went on a hike called the Echo Canyon Trail. Now, let me tell you about this hike. It was easiest, easily the hardest hike I have ever done in my life. The hike was only a mile and a quarter in length, but it gained 1,400 feet and elevation over that short distance. So it was incredibly steep, and it even involved some rock climbing. But here's what's important. Emily had already done that hike a few years earlier, so she warned me. And so she told me what to expect, so I packed the right shoes. I showed up early in the morning for the hike before it got hot. I was hydrated, I was prepared, and so I had a great experience because I had the right expectations. Jesus, on the other hand, had a problem with the people around him having the wrong expectations. As he got closer to Jerusalem, rumors were spreading. People were saying that as soon as he set foot in the city, the kingdom of God was going to instantly appear, and everything would be made right in a moment. But Jesus knew that that wasn't God's plan. Jesus knew that something incredible was going to happen in Jerusalem, but it wasn't the kingdom of God instantly appearing. What was going to happen is Jesus was going to be crucified. And then he was going to rise from the dead. And then he was going to ascend into heaven, and time was going to pass before he came again. So nothing was going to happen immediately. So Jesus told this parable to clarify God's plan, and set his disciples' expectations. In the parable, the nobleman 
goes away before he becomes king. In the same way, Jesus died, rose, and ascended into heaven before he will eventually return and make all things right and bring his kingdom on earth. So that's the first key to understanding this parable. The nobleman who becomes king represents Jesus, and his return from the far country represents his second coming. Here's the second key to understanding the parable. The rebellious citizens represent people who reject Jesus. When Jesus told this parable, the main people who he had in mind were the Jewish religious leaders who had rejected him and opposed him throughout his ministry. But the rebellious citizens represent anyone who rejects Jesus, whether that took place 2,000 years ago or today. And Jesus is warning us, friends, that rebelling against him will eventually end in destruction and death. Maybe you struggle with the language of verse 27. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Remember, parables are meant to be analogies, so this isn't meant to be an exact description of how Jesus will punish his enemies. But we all need to understand that the Bible teaches clearly that the judgment that will come on those who reject Jesus will be decisive and deadly. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9 says, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So the rebellious citizens represent people who reject Jesus, and the punishment that they experience represents the judgment that will come on Jesus' enemies at his second coming. Here's the third key to understanding the parable. The servants represent Jesus' disciples. In the parable, the servants received minas, which was an ancient form of money which is equal to thousands of dollars today. In the same way, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he left his disciples as stewards or managers. Now, what did the minas represent? What did the minas represent? Christians have been given many things by Jesus, but most importantly, like 1 Thessalonians 2.4 says, we've been entrusted with the gospel. Christians have been entrusted with the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, this raises a big question. Who does a third servant represent? Who does a third servant represent? There are two options. First, the third servant could represent a disciple of Jesus who is truly a disciple. So someone who is really a Christian, but they're unfaithful with what God has given them to steward. So they receive a rebuke when Jesus returns. But there's a second option. The third servant could represent somebody who is connected to the Christian community in some way. Amen. So they look like a disciple of Jesus, but they're not truly a follower of him. They never truly loved Jesus. In other words, a non-Christian. Now remember, I told you at the beginning of this sermon that I thought this was the hardest of Jesus' parables to interpret, and this is part of the reason why. But I think that Jesus is most likely talking about somebody who looks like they're a disciple of Jesus. So they're a part of the Christian community in some way, but they were never truly a follower of him. I won't give you all the reasons why, but I'll give you a couple. I'll explain why I think this is the case. Jesus tells a similar parable in Matthew 25. Many of you will be familiar with the parable of the talents. And in that parable, Jesus describes a similar situation, but the third servant is not only rebuked. This is what Matthew 25, 30 says. 
and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in that similar parable, in Matthew 25, Jesus describes the third servant receiving eternal punishment. So I'm interpreting what happens in Luke 19 in light of Matthew 25 in saying that the third servant may not be a believer. Also, in the parable itself, think about this. The third servant misunderstands the king, is afraid of him, and doesn't follow his orders. It's hard to see how that person is representing a disciple of Jesus. So for those reasons, I think the third servant represents someone who was never truly a Christian. Now, I don't want to miss the forest for the trees. I was talking to my dad about this problem this week and how this should be interpreted, and he said something that I wanted to share with you because I thought it was wise. He said, it's hard to decide who the third servant represents, but it's not hard to see that you don't want him to represent you. I think that's a good point, okay? It's hard to see who the third servant represents, but it's not hard to see that you don't want him to represent you. So brothers or sis- brothers and sisters, it's hard to decide. Is the third servant representing a true Christian or a non-Christian? But it's not hard to see how to apply this parable to our lives. It's a warning against unfaithfulness. So let's bring it all together. The king is Jesus. The citizens are people who reject Jesus as king, and the servants are Jesus' disciples. So that's what this parable means. But what's the point? What's the point for our lives today? This parable is about accountability and judgment, isn't it? In this parable, you can see two ways of rejecting Jesus. One is outright opposing him, like the citizens who are his enemies. But the other one is more subtle. It's unfaithfulness, like the third servant. So I think we can take two big things away from this parable for the Christian life. Two big takeaways for the Christian life. And the first is Jesus rewards faithfulness. That's the first clear takeaway from this parable. Jesus rewards faithfulness. In verse 26, The king says, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now that might be confusing at first, but this is what it means. When someone is faithful to Jesus, their faithfulness will mean that they take what he has given them and put it to work which means that they will have something to show for it. They will have something. When that happens, Jesus will celebrate and reward them. So the person who has something, because they've been faithful with Jesus' resources, will receive more from Jesus, will receive a reward. On the other hand, if someone is unfaithful to Jesus, and if they don't steward and manage the gospel, they won't have anything to show for their life. They won't have anything to show to Jesus. They'll have nothing. And in that case, even what they have will be taken away from them, like the unfaithful servant in the parable. So according to Jesus, what separates the haves from the have-nots in eternity is faithfulness to him. I tell you, that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Jesus gives overwhelming rewards for faithfulness, doesn't he? Ten cities for the servant who had ten minus. And five cities for the servant who had five. In comparison with a mina, a city is an outstanding reward. It's like rewarding a bicycle with a Ferrari. Okay, it's an overwhelming reward. But in the parable, the city isn't the greatest reward. Did you notice what the king said to the first servant 
well done, good servant. When Jesus returns, that's what each of us should want to hear from him. We should want to hear, well done, good servant. Because the greatest reward is not what we'll receive from Jesus. The greatest reward is his pleasure. The greatest reward is his praise of being in fellowship with our king. And of course, brothers and sisters, Jesus is trying to motivate us. He's not just telling this to be a good story. He's trying to motivate us to live faithfully. In this room, right, there are people who are teenagers living at home. Parents who are working to provide for their families, retired individuals, and many other life situations. But the parable of the ten minas shows that Jesus expects each of us, if we're his disciples, to be faithful managers and stewards of the gospel. Jesus intends for each of us, whatever our circumstances, to take the gospel and put it to work in our lives. I want you to notice something. In the parable, the two servants aren't equally faithful. So they aren't equally rewarded. Did you notice that? In the case of the first servant, ten minas are rewarded with ten cities. In the case of the second servant, five minas are rewarded with five cities. Jesus recognizes that some of his disciples are more with what he's given them. So, brothers and sisters, Jesus isn't calling us to be minimally faithful. He's challenging us to be maximally faithful. Jesus doesn't want his disciples to ask, what is the least that I can do with what God has given me? Jesus doesn't want us asking that question. How can I do something so that I feel a little bit less convicted on Sunday mornings. Jesus doesn't want us asking that question. He wants us to ask, how can I get the most out of what he's given me? How can I make the biggest impact for the kingdom of God? How can I take the gospel and have something to show for it when Jesus returns? But at the same time, in the parable, the faithful can't be proud. Because when the servants report to their master, did you notice in the parable, they talk about what the money did, not what they did. Look at verse 16. Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. Look at verse 18. Your mina has made five minas. You see, in the parable, the servants knew that they wouldn't even have the opportunity to be faithful if the king hadn't given them something to manage. In the same way, faithful Christians can't be proud. We would have nothing to manage if Jesus hadn't saved us and given us the gospel, something priceless to manage in our lives. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about faithfulness. I'm talking about degrees of rewards and eternity. I'm not talking about how someone is saved from their sins. The Bible makes it absolutely clear that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ and turns from their sins will be saved. And brothers and sisters, the Bible makes it clear that even the weakest Christian will spend an eternity with King Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And we've all wasted our time. We've all spent time chasing after sin instead of investing our time, energy, and resources that things will matter for eternity. And we can find forgiveness in Christ for that. But Jesus is saying to us, don't settle. Live for more. Live for maximum faithfulness. Not because our salvation depends on it, but because we want the praise of our King. Now, I've been talking about faithfulness, but when the King sees unfaithfulness, like the third servant, he rebukes and punishes it. He doesn't overlook it. 
In the parable, the king commands that the money be taken away from the third servant and given to the first. So when someone is unfaithful to Jesus, everything will be taken from them. And that brings me to the second takeaway. And this is the final thing we're going to talk about from this passage. A second takeaway for the Christian life. Jesus holds both his servants and his enemies accountable. Jesus holds both his servants and his enemies accountable. The reason the parable of the ten miners is so challenging is because Jesus has a message for his friends and a message for his enemies. If you're a Christian, Jesus is saying to us, I'm going to hold you accountable for what you've done with what I've given you. That's what Jesus is saying to his friends. Jesus is saying that to Christians. And if you're not a Christian, Jesus is saying that rejecting him can only end in your destruction. Look, sometimes when Jesus teaches, it's comforting. Other times when Jesus teaches, it feels like you got punched in the gut. And the parable of the ten minus falls in that second category. Okay? But it's a message that we all need to hear. Jesus will hold us accountable for what we've done. And we all need to hear that message because accountability is a good thing. Accountability isn't comfortable, but accountability is what motivates us to get up in the morning to work out. And it's what motivates us to use our resources for the glory of God. So if you're a Christian, the main thing that you need to take away from this parable is that you're accountable to Jesus for how you manage his resources. And one day, he will hold you personally accountable for how you've done that. Jesus will hold me accountable. Jesus will hold you accountable. Jesus will hold every one of his servants accountable for what they've done with what he gave us. Here's one really practical way that you can apply this parable to your life. And it might be counterintuitive, but this is how. Build relationships with other Christians where they hold you accountable. That's how you can apply this parable to your life. Because when other people hold you accountable. It helps you live like Jesus will hold you accountable one day. And when another Christian holds you accountable, take it as a gift. I'll put it this way. Either someone else will hold you accountable in this life, or Jesus will hold you accountable when he returns. So build relationships where other believers hold you accountable. I'll give you one way that you can do this. One way is by joining a church. The command to join a church isn't explicit in the Bible, but church membership is a form of accountability. When you join a church, you're accountable for what you believe. You're accountable for how you live. You're accountable for how you represent Jesus in your community. Also, if you're already a member of a church, then you can find another member of your church to meet with. And you can talk to them about your struggles with sin. They can pray for you. They can ask you how things are going. Or you can get involved in a Sunday school. You can get involved in a life group. While we have Sunday schools and life groups for several reasons, one is that accountability works best in smaller groups of people. So that you can get to know people better and they can pray for you. But remember, there is the third servant. Let's come back to him. What does the third servant look like in our world today? Helmut Thielicke was a German pastor, and he said this about the mentality of the third servant. I want you to hear this. I can't be active, but I can at least be a conservative. I can preserve the Christian tradition. I can submit to a church wedding and send my children to Sunday school. I can take a Christian point of view. I can wrap my religion in my handkerchief and conserve it. The third servant represents what is often called nominal Christianity today. That is, Christianity 
and name only. The parable of the ten minas is a warning. Jesus is not fooled by external appearances. In the book of Revelation, it talks about how Jesus will return one day and he'll come back as a conquering king. And he'll reveal everything. Those who were faithful, those who were unfaithful, those who hated him, and those who loved him. But, brothers and sisters, Jesus told this parable when he was about to go into Jerusalem. And you know what he did there, right? You know that he allowed himself to be slaughtered for his enemies. So Jesus told this parable as a warning. But Jesus made it possible for any of us to be saved from this judgment. And Jesus promised to give his Holy Spirit to sinners so that they could actually live a life of faithfulness to him. So, this is a warning, but the third servant doesn't have to be anyone else. The enemies of the king don't have to be any one of us. Jesus offers forgiveness to anyone by his death. I want to end this series by going back to where we began. Some of you were here eight weeks ago where I talked about how Jesus used his parables to conceal and to reveal. The parables aren't stories 